So, uh, thank you for uh, forcing me to try to think it through. And uh, as you might have read, that um, it's uh, the more I wrote this uh, draft, the more I'm uh, in a deliberation in how much what I have to suggest today is fruitful and heuristic. And I will be happy for the discussion. Uh, this uh, project started from my uh, doctorate in which I tried to flesh out the attitudes of Jewish law towards international law. And then I had to, uh, to put into the equation the state law. And I had this inter a complex interaction between multiple legal systems. And I had to make sense out of it in terms of what Professor Ben Menachem uh, 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 stated. Uh, what is the image or what is the internal perception of Jewish law about what's going on in this changing world where suddenly there is uh, we have a new state law and then we have a new system that comes above or by the state law which is international law and how do we conceptualize it and uh, 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 the I tried to flesh out this argument in an article I published last year, uh, the systemic, dynamic, and complex analysis of uh, the interaction of Jewish and other legal systems in which I relate to some of the problems that were, we discussed in the previous session. But, and here I have the pleasure of reminding uh, Professor Ben Menachem of uh, another uh, uh, of his tendency to be uh, the devil's advocate, which is very fruitful, because um, all the time that I wrote this article, I sat with a problem that arose at a cocktail party uh, uh, at Suzanne Last Stone's apartment, uh, in which I had two devastating questions, which almost stopped my doc my study for my doctorate. One from Yumanachem, one from Yumima, and that evening, I came uh, out of that evening really thinking I have to maybe abandon my research project. Uh, finally, making, I think, uh, Yumima's uh, question probably made my uh, one of the chapters much better. And today I'll try to respond to the other one, although it contradicts what you did today. Because what you said at that evening is I approach you and ask you, um, I have this problem about meetings between legal systems. Mifgashe mishpat. And you said to me, Mifgashe mishpat? There is no such thing as Mifgashe mishpat. That is analytically impossible. And we discussed. What? Yeah. yeah. I, I, we fleshed it out, don't worry, I, I, but it remained in my mind for a long time. So, for various other reasons, I want today to try to introduce an additional, as far as I know, uh, um, uh, new suggestion to how to define the area of Jewish law, and to add it to the existing definitions and to see is this a, a useful tool to think about problems in Jewish law, especially the problem we discussed today. So what I want to do is to say that Jewish law is Jews law, the law of the Jews. So Geraldine, the, we discussed this yesterday, uh, all the jurisprudence written or produced by Jews. It can be rabbis, it can be Jewish legislators, it can be a Jewish state, it can be Frankfurter or Brandeis. Is there something Jewish about Jewish international lawyers? Is that an interesting category of research? I don't know, maybe yes, maybe no. There's a discussion about this. Okay, second, all non-Jewish law that relates to Jews. How can we discuss a lot of things in Jewish law without having cut out from us, from all the legal systems around the world, all over the areas, all the laws 
which try to direct Jews, Jewish property, whatever. So if a German municipality made a bylaw about how to regulate a Jewish cemetery or the, uh, I, I don't know, the um, um, sanitary conditions in the Jewish neighborhood, maybe we miss something in the Jewish legal things going on there because we don't know the legal background about what is going on there. So that is a second category. But today I want, I, around the law of the Jews, which is a big category, I want to focus on one part of it, which is all laws that apply to Jews as Jews perceive them. Because we came here today under a few legal systems. Because we drove here today under uh, traffic laws and we exist under multiple legal systems. And we perceive, if we ask, what are the laws that relate to you? What regulates your life? We don't say, okay, in Jewish law this, state law this, international law this, maybe if I work in another company then I have maybe all, all kind of other norms. I have a reality that regulates my life. And a lot of times I don't put some, so much thought into where do I go or what, uh, I ask other friends what the law is or what the norm is. Only when there are real problems, I start to ask to which authority I go to get advice or to which court I go to get a ruling. But the experience and perception of law and even of legal philosophy and the concept of law itself is created out of a reality that is built out of different sources. Now, traditionally, we define Jewish law by its sources. Rambam, uh, everything that comes from the Bible comes from uh, Torah, Rambam, sources, and non-Jewish. But if I look at it from the person's perspective, okay? Okay, sorry. Whoops. That was not so smart. Leave it. Uh, um, sorry. Here I could have used it. Um, so Elon defines Jewish law as the interse intersection between Jewish and non-Jewish law. Only the intersection is Jewish law. Engler famously says... Jewish law in, in the concept of Mishpat Ivri. Mishpat Ivri. Mishpat Ivri. Okay, okay, okay. Mishpat Ivri. Yeah, Jewish law. Okay, okay. Uh, Engler famously argues with him and says, no, you can't disconnect it from all of Jewish law. So this is Jewish law. But here I will uh, say, sorry, Jews' law is all law that relates to Jews, including ritual law for whoever it, it uh, relates to him or her, and non-Jewish law, even if it's not covered by Jewish law, because there are areas of law that are not covered yet by Jewish law. Moreover, I want to say, this is internalized in the individual Jew who is embedded in the Jewish community, who is embedded in a general community. So it's not like we see most of the time that there is a legal system and we live in a legal system. Psychologically and sociologically, the law is internalized and therefore it's socialized. And not every time, I, maybe there are parents that tell their kids, you know, you're praying because the source is in Shulchan Aruch, and you don't cross the red light in uh, the red light because it's state law. No, we say this is you do this, you don't do that. And the moment you socialize without differentiating, you're creating. And sometimes for some people, it might be that missing one time Birkat Amazon for a kid five years old is not so bad, but crossing the street not at the, cro at the crossroads, that's, that's awful. 
And not every time it will be because it's pikuach nefesh, but because it's forbidden. So I ask myself, is this experience and this analytical unit of Jews' law, has it an interesting impact on the question of the influence of changes, what was the definition of the conference, of changes or developments in non-Jewish law on Jewish law? Um, okay, this, just to say, this is not static. Uh, I can't do a movie, but you should imagine this, all these circles change all the time because it changes over time. It is embedded in a, this, the interaction between the Jewish community and the non-Jewish community, which of, of course changes, and the relation between the individual and the community changes because some individuals play this, place themselves only in the Jewish community, some place themselves in both communities, some place themselves outside of Jewish community, but still influence it. Uh, uh, it's also a category that enables us to, to treat non-observant Jews in interesting ways. Um, okay, so all the details that I could think of are, are in the article, so I, I won't, in the draft. So what is the argument relating to this conference? The response of Jewish law to non-Jewish law depends on relevancy, distance. We, can, uh, we will be very hard to find a reaction of Jewish law to Japanese law. I challenge you to try to find one. Or even now that we know more about Japanese law, because most Jews don't live in Japan, haven't experienced Japanese law, if you would hear a very interesting idea from Japanese law, would you promote it to try to use it in your uh, halachic thought, much less so than, than legal systems that are closer to you psychologically, geographically, and in your experience. Or we could say the same argument oppositely. All non-Jewish law, which is Jews' law, either in practice or perception, so they relate to Jews in any way, first, are potentially relevant, because they're part of my life, in some way, and they have some legitimacy. Have some legitimacy to the extent they are, that I feel that they're inherently part of my life. To the extent that I cannot deny my existence. So if a law succeeds to overtake part of my life, like what happened in Russia, therefore I so much like the example from Tuesday night, it doesn't matter that I maybe oppose it uh, uh, theoretically, theologically. I, they're they're anti-religious. The whole idea of this equality is based on a opposition to God. But I can't deny that the equal, gender equality became part of life which I can't deny anymore as I can't deny my existence. And therefore, I can't deny its relevancy to the process of halachic thinking. It doesn't come from the theory, not from the sources, not from an intellectual, legal process, but from the experience that it's part of my perception of law, reality, life. Therefore, and here comes the punchline, non-Jewish law, which is Jews' law, in some sense is not foreign. It's not external. It may be not internal. It's not Jewish. It's not maybe holy. But maybe the tools to think about it is not like adoption. I liked your last, okay? The, the, the epitome of acceptance and also the image Elon uses are a transplantation of norms. 
okay, Watson, or uh, adoption of norms. But these words talk about taking something foreign, strange, importing norms, right? We have these norms, images that we use. They all don't talk about taking something from my right hand and pass it to my left hand, but take something from outside and bringing it inside. So, except Olevsky, which was a great example, think about Rabbi Feinstein on in inheritance, and he says, everybody does it. How can we otherwise explain it? Or uh, the argument between Feinstein and Waldenberg about treating non-Jews on Shabbat and trying to find a reason how everybody is doing it and then trying to regulate it. Now, I'll try to to uh, give a few examples of implications and I'll open it, uh, open it for discussions, I think. So, uh, one is to focus on something we haven't focused in this uh, conference yet, but I think it's very interesting. Um, if indeed this is correct, then the, sometimes the most crucial phase about influence on Jewish law is not when is to try to prevent legislation in the non-Jewish system. Or to say, if you legislate, give me exemption. So a very interesting Jewish legal source to think about the attitude of Jewish law towards non-Jewish law is not in the responsa after the fact, but in the legislation process, in the shtadlanut, in the politics, Jewish politics, about how to influence the legislation in the non-Jewish by bribes in old times and by politics in present times, as we know in Israel uh, uh, very well. Either we try to prevent legislation so it won't influence us, and if we can't prevent it, we want all kinds of exemptions. Because the moment it will be Jews law, it will influence us. And I can't be, think about a better example than wo voting rights for women. Which was, you should die and never allow it, and whatever. But when the Jewish uh, community in Israel decided that women would have... In uh, uh, what? In Palestine. In Palestine, yes. Uh, would have voting rights without any good legal reasoning, Haredi women would vote. Where's the Yaregu Baliavo? Where did it go? It stayed about uh, passive voting rights, right? Because they have this exemption from equality. They can run a party without women. Now, tell me, if the legislator would say, uh, from the next election, you can only run with a party with a woman in it, would they give up their political power? The answer is no. They would find a legal solution. Now, what is interesting about it is that in this uh, occasion, there is no legal text. The legal text we have is their, their attempt to prevent the legislation in the 20s. Then we have some uh, uh, evidence of um, private practices in which husbands would get two votes, actually. So the actual act was done by the husband for the wives in uh, Arabic and uh, ultra uh, and Haredi areas. Uh, so there is a voting right for the woman. She has a vote, but she's not doing the act. So this is a kind of halachic solution and a chauvinist solution to controlling the vote. But, uh, but the moment it's not possible, women want to vote. And there is almost no writing, legal explanation how does this come to be? Why is it not needed? Because it's a fact of life. Um, so this changes a bit our sources that we uh, look uh, on. And I think uh, the same we can do about definition uh, of death, but I'll leave that out now. The second one, uh, second issue I want to raise is the enigma of areas of uh, lacunae uh, in Jewish law. 
vast areas of law that have, have been, been almost not been treated. How can we explain that a legal system that tells itself a total legal system gives up vast areas of law and that doesn't treat them? And the simple answer is this, because it's regulated. Now, if you ask somebody, is there a Jewish law of, tax, of, of state tax? He would say, yes, there is. Where is it? Not developed yet. Why? Well, we don't have a Torah state yet. Yeah, but in other areas of law, you don't say that. You, you discuss very theoretical things. No, but we have a good system which works, so you don't feel the need. The same, uh, I took uh, in another article, tried to discuss genocide and rape, but we can talk about traffic, zoning, public law, whatever. An interesting consequence of this is that it's not that Jewish law doesn't relate to it. Because when it doesn't, isn't so nice that I'm not allowed to build another room in my house, the zoning policy, then Kleinman, Ron Kleinman showed that in Haredi community, they say it's not so... Property in Jewish law is total property, so you can build as long as you can, as long as the building holds, and even more. Uh, so, but the system doesn't take the responsibility to develop the, the law, because then they would have to take responsibility for the, cons uh, the consequences. But in another look at it, they try to, they have interpretive leeway, minimization, skewing, so we have all kind of very interesting uh, uh, legal interactions between the non-Jewish law and Jewish law, which at w same and one time show that it is an internal law and it's external. So it is, it's a dual uh, 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 thing. And uh, I think that only when we recognize that this is both Jews' law and foreign law, we can start to analyze these dynamics in a better way. And here we come to the problem I'm struggling with for a year. Is what I'm going to say now interesting? Is there a difference, a conceptual, jurisprudential theoretical difference in Jewish law between thinking about non-Jewish law, which is part of my life, or internal Jewish law. So is there, uh, no, wait a second. Uh, the, it, not everything which is internal necessarily influences itself, uh, each other. So Isura and Mamona, you don't learn. Also inside internal uh, Jewish law, you have categories that you don't, that don't influence each other. So you could say, and here's why I wake up sometimes in the morning and say, maybe I should take this article and throw it. Uh, so non-Jewish law, which is internalized in Jews' law, is like a kind of internal legal category, but it's not different from other legal categories, and maybe I'm not learning from it, it doesn't influence, it's, a, it's like a difference between Isua and Mamona, and even worse than that. But I'm still here because on other mornings I wake up and I say, we have clear rules about when you learn Isua mi Mamona, which, in which terms these issues are part of one legal system. And you have clear things where you say, no, these are two separate realms. I think that regarding non-Jewish law, which is regarded as internal, the borders are much less clear. Because there is no clear process how to do this. As long as we regarded it as external law, and you import it, then you have somebody at the border says, do you have a permit? Or you have somebody said, do you have something to declare in your pockets? But the moment it's internal, nobody checks what's going on inside. So there is less process, and there, we need other tools to think about what is going on there. More psychological, 
cultural, and therefore I liked your your uh, use of uh, um, what was the uh, the Hebrew term you use? Poza, right? Because it's it's it. I attacked you that it wasn't defined enough, but it helps me because it's not defined enough because that's really what's going on. Is it poza nechshav tofes? which is what I do in social life. That's not what I do in legal life. In legal life, I take a position. I don't take a posa, right? Something which I can defend, define. But I think you're right. What is going on is cultural, is posa. Um, so some uh, kind of internal relations. One is the minimum standard. I can't go beyond, below my own legal, my own minimum standard. So I have this little movie, but the speakers don't work. Uh, a month ago, uh, Rav Bareli was here at a conference, and he uh, was against Kimli. He went, there is a minute tirade against Kimli. Why, although Kimli is well established, we have to abolish it in the Bate Din Le Mamonot, in the civil rabbinical courts in Israel, and there should be a Takana against it, because nobody will come with us when Kimli just the uh, same language. He, uh, I have a minute and 20 seconds in which he uh, uh, totally ridicules it. And he shows nobody. This is the, the beginning point of a chance for uh, civil rabbinical courts is to abolish Kimli. Because it says nobody right in his mind will be uh, uh, just in one system and so ridiculous in another system. Uh, the same Chilul Hashem, which we had both in Tunisia, Olevsky, and my research in international law, the area of consent, we, which we have discussed. Secondly, it can uh, uh, explain something very interesting about the global Jewish legal discourse, and this relates to your talk this morning, Geraldine, if indeed people are um, like, uh, help me, Professor Ben Menachem Kant, people are shvuyim batoda'a batfisa shalatzmam. They can't see reality. They are uh, not enslaved. They are um, Bound? captured by the, uh, the the way they perceive the world. Okay, so. We can't blame the people in East Europe not understanding what is going on in the French Revolution. Even if the people would tell them, if you don't live it, you, you don't know how meaningful it is or isn't for Jewish life. And therefore, the, conver the global conversation before globalization uh, maybe eased it again, um, is really difficult. And I'm not sure that globalization solves the problem. Um, as a side, I would say that this relates to, uh, not a side, as a third issue, I would say this relates to rit ritual law too. The rediscussion of circumcision in Europe didn't start from care about Jews, even not about Islam. It started from the German uh, constitutional um, uh, value, not of freedom and consent, which for kids can be done by parents, but by human dignity. Because the German experience said, by, uh, uh, by consent you can get to Hitler. So the new constitution after uh, after the World War II, has to be based, uh, as far as I understand uh, this issue, uh, on the, the, the value of human dignity. This is a difference in the conceptual understanding of uh, the basic of the Constitution between the United States and, and Germany. And di human dignity hurting a kid's body, it's not sure that a parent can consent. Here there is a, a, a contradiction between consent and human dignity. So there is a real problem. Now this change didn't have anything to do with circumcision as long as it was considered two realms. The moment somebody 
said, hey, these issues relate to each other. It became part of Jewish law. Because it became part of Jews' law. Why it became part of Jews' law? Because suddenly somebody realized, hey, this applies to uh, this Jewish practice. And suddenly it became a part of the Jews' law. And now Jews' law have maybe to think about what human dignity and the attitude to the human body and uh, parents-children relations in preservation of bodies. All kind of new things arise because suddenly it becomes part of the discourse of Jewish law. So uh, Professor Greitzer talked about uh, kashrut and its enmeshment, embeddedment with areas of law, which seemingly have not, nothing to do with it, but suddenly, uh, not only that it doesn't harm, sometimes this is the only way to keep up kashrut. Uh, so it's very complicated. And again, uh, uh, the talk from this morning uh, about uh, civil divorce. If it's undeniably part of uh, 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 Jewish life, we have to do something with it. We can't leave it outside. We can. Don't worry. Uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> and, uh, I would say, analytically, yes, and my, that is a great proof for my theory because see how much cultural resources go into the effort Indeed. to separate these dynamics from Jews' life. There is a theory that says that part of the politics of the Haredi community in Israel is to try to create a buffer zone. They don't want really to regulate Jews' life. They don't care so much about uh, non-observant uh, Jews and whatever. Uh, what they want is that their kids won't see people that the kids perceive as Jews do certain things and then raise questions. So either have geographical separation or have a public Jewish uh, square, sphere, uh, in order to uh, buffer the experience of what Jews' life is. Um, so I leave uh, some methodological questions or put some methodological questions on the table. I think that this causes me to, caused me the last year to reconsider very hard what is the internal, if we would do a conference about what is the influence of Ashkenazi on Sephardi law and back and forth. Okay? And do a conference, try to define how they influence each other, in what ways. Okay? Uh, and is there, is there a essential difference between that and then between Jewish and non-Jewish law? Uh, or areas of Jewish law? Can we use concepts from uh, general law, like acoustic separation or normative separation, to think about this? Is there differences between different people? We know that people can live with different levels of social identity complexity. There are people that can live only with people like themselves and that have a very defined one-track identity. I'm only Jewish. There are people who can say, I'm Jewish and I'm Russian, I'm Jewish and I'm American, I'm Jewish and I'm Israeli. I'm Jewish and I'm Israeli, I'm an affiliate human. I am a doctor. Well, yeah, no right, yes, no right, uh, uh, yeah. of doctor. course. And and in certain environments, can I change my identity according to different things? Or there are people that every place behave exactly the same. So do people experience the problems we discuss differently with uh, different kinds of psychology, sociology, sociological powers, which has to do with um, uh, uh, also dimensions of law, like uh, the multiplicities of law and the complexity of each legal system. Um, before posing the questions, I will uh, make one more comment about the issue of uh, puzzled, uh, because I wrote a bit about images, and I say, okay, so if transplantation and adopting and grafting 
is not relevant to this kind of perspective. And translation and dialogue also have this element of foreignty. What kind of images, what kind of puzzles can we talk about, about how you relate not to, your, to the non-Jew living in America and not to the non-Jew living in Um el Fahem, but the influence from your spouse? If we think this is internalized, this is part of my life, this is undeniably part of my life. It's not me. But this is not adoption. So maybe osmosis or, or other images that we have to think about because the images we use in language influence the way we conceptualize, think, and think about them. So is the analyst the ana analysis different if we consider it internal? That's one question. Second, can we find political, halachic, markers or signs to this um, proposed scope or look at things. Thank you. Okay, so um, first of all, thank you. I think it is a very uh, fertile uh, paper that uh, it opens up a lot of room for thought and discussion. I will also say that you neglected Brandeis and Frankfurter. In other words, in the sense of legal literature or normative literature written or composed or legislated by Jews um, is different than yeah. The Raj, uh, I don't know, the in laws of Iceland and for the Jews living in Iceland. Okay, so this is another issue which you, you did. I paid, I paid Svi for this question. <laughs> so actually in, the, uh, in uh, um, uh, so actually I think there are three types of Jews law. <coughs> Each deserves separate research. This is a research project to think about this, to, to think about this and to put this in interaction with what we have done very fertile and are continuing to do in the, what we call now Jewish law. So um, uh, uh, one of the three types is law by Jews, which includes all rabbinical law, which was probably done by Jews, except the bit that was done by God, but most of it was done by Jews. And then we have uh, 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 not only Brandeis and Frankfurter, we have also Jewish politicians that legislate uh, or write about law in all kinds of ways. Law professors, some Jews, some were. Um, and actually, there is a doctorate uh, being written by Reut Paz uh, here in Barilan um, under supervision of Marty Koskoniemi from Helsinki, which asks the question uh, Are the Jewish, uh, so, sorry, international lawyers of Jewish descent, uh, Kaufmann, Lauterpacht, uh, is there anything Jewish about them? Because if we think about all these luminaries of international law in the 19th, uh, 20th century, uh, there is a lot of Jews there. And so she did a very nice... International law? You go yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a Hollandic person. No, he was Hebraist. Yeah, yeah, but... Uh, Sorry, Gautius. No, that's not the yeah. same. Okay. That, is, that is another area of research. I'm talking about these uh, Jews, which we have already second or third generation. Then after the first generation, we have the second generation of Hankin, Reisman, whatever. Nobody wrote about that yet, but these, these uh, um, international lawyers from Jewish, German, Austrian, Hungarian descent is an area of research, actually. Uh, and I think there is a, a bit written about uh, Brandeis and Frankfurter, but not uh, enough. 
and we could think about Israeli legislation in the same way. And it has halachic consequences because this should be in interaction with type B and type C Jews law because do Jews accept laws legislated by Jews differently? The Schechter case, was it received by the Jewish community because Brandeis was on the, on the court differently than if it would have been uh, wh whoever, okay? Uh, and how it interacts with Jewish law. And it, again, this is not a one-way direction. It might be that if it's a Jew, it's worse. It's not better. I will find it more, I don't know. But we won't know before we start doing the work. Well, just complete before, the, okay, that uh, several years ago, when there was such a thing in Bar Ilan University called the Rockford Center, uh, and uh, I was running it, and so I came to a person called Chava Pinchas Kohim, and I said to her, what do you think about the idea of literature written by Jews, which is not about Jewish content. Mm -hmm. Jews yeah, yeah, write yeah. literature throughout the world in many languages. And she, she taught a certain course in bar -Lan, but more important on the basis of this, uh, uh, with the help of the Rapport Center and other places, okay, there began a conference, series of conferences called Kisufin, which took, several of them took place in, in, in Jerusalem over the years, and it's an issue of funding, in which the discussion was literature, poetry, and so on, By in Jews? which the authors were Jews, many of them completely secular, and so on, and some of the authors came to these conferences and talked with each other, and very interesting things. And denied that they're Jewish. Not at all. <laughs> and very interesting things developed about Indeed, this there is this book, The Jewish Century. This is an area of discussion which hasn't entered law. I, I agree. Uh -huh. well, uh, yes? If you say it hasn't entered law, um, there, there is a parallel, the Mitra Sharafi's work on, uh, on the. Who? Mitra Sharafi from uh, Wisconsin Law School, and her work on, pa on the Parsis in, uh, in, uh, in, in India during the British colonial period. Yeah. And she talks there about Parsis uh, who reached. Who, how they uh, went into the legal, the British legal profession, making it all the way to the Privy Council, and how they were judges in the Bombay uh, Supreme Court. Um, and, that, and what struck me, though, is she is extremely careful to say that even though they're parties who are in the law, in the legal system, to say that they are doing more and they're actually giving a, a, a party judgment. If the judgment has some type of Parsi uh, feel to it. She's very careful about saying that, even though she does make it an argument about one uh, famous, one, one Supreme Court judge there, uh, Davar, who's, uh, who did it. Uh, and I would, so there is a little bit of work yeah. for you yeah. to, to compare to. Um, I, have to I have to admit, I, I found your paper difficult to, uh, to understand the very, uh, uh, for me, it was, it's, it was very um, abstract. Um, uh, very, and I think, you know, my, I, I'm just sharing with you a thought that maybe having some more concrete, uh, uh, concrete, even empirical, I don't know if empirical, empirical is the right word, but some more concrete analysis, uh, you know, to throw around Brandeis and Frankfurter, is there really some, is there really a... No, 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 there, no, uh, uh, let's, let's put it aside. That I did only because we discussed it yesterday in the article, I, I mentioned it in the beginning and I throw it away because I say that's not my... my unit of analysis to discuss our issue today. What I try to discuss the issue today is what happens if we relate, if we recognize that in some sense, non-Jewish law, which is discussed or deliberated or thought about by Jewish law as maybe influencing, already in most cases is not totally external anymore because it's Jews law. And that the fact that it's Jews' law is influencing the dynamics and uh, uh, analytically more than the halachic move that will be used later. That is, I think, what I'm trying to say. I, 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 I think that the only one in the conference where I can't 
put my finger on, which is happily so because I am well versed with his work, so I have a solution to it, is uh, Rabbi uh, Chalfon Moshe Cohen from Jerba, who lives relatively uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a bubble, which he preserves with uh, an iron hand, and he chooses to import norms from the French Revolution and all kind of thoughts into his thoughts, although he lives in a bubble. And I think that for him the answer is, is because he does it because he sees that the only future of the Jewish people in his messianic outlook is in a world which will be under these values and therefore he prepares the way. So for him it is Jews' law, not Jews' law here now for my community. No, but he admires these values. Yeah. It's not yes. just the fact so, of nature so, I have to live So on. he says he lives in it intellectually so he knows about them. In that sense it's Jews' law. And although he resents it as part of his daily reality, he discusses it because he wants it to be the reality in the future. Okay? But Think about it. Why? Why do we always are we so obsessed? If it's only comparative law, or if it's only to reject or only to accept, why don't we relate to legal systems that don't apply to Jews? What isn't there anything to say about Jewish law and Japanese law? Somebody can write a doctor about it. Great, should do it. Nobody understands it, so you, you get an easy doctor. Okay, uh, but no, it's not relevant because it's not relevant for Jews, so it's not a non-issue. Which for me proves that there, the 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 interna, in, internality is a, a, an aspect inherent aspect of this discussion, which we miss because we always use the quest, the, the language as if it's foreign. <laughs> Be, uh, because it's much easier to uh, to deal with somebody who is already conceptually half inside than to relate to something that is outside, right? No. Okay. Okay. Your claim is very similar to that of uh, Justice President Aaron Barak. What? Okay, what Barak said in few articles is that uh, we don't need Jewish law because we have Jews law. As a Jews law is the state of Israel law. We have a legal system for it's the first time in the world when it was 40 years or something. We have our uh, independent legal system. It is um, Jews law. And he, yes, and he also uh, wrote that uh, he is the one who uh, wrote the Hokes Adot Mishpat when he was Attorney General in the 70s. And he wrote, you can see it in Shnatona Mishpat, I really think. And uh, there is uh, appendix, one of the articles there. His articles, I think that he, yes, I do uh, admit that I use the term "konot." I enjoy the kavod shel Shalom v'chavut shel Moreshi Yisrael and not Mishpat Ivri because I didn't mean Jewish law. I mean Jews law because Kafka and Buber and all the and Agnon and all the Jewish literature, it's a part of my Jewish values and I want to use mm -hmm. it our so it's very problematic because you can see that at that time I think also today most of the people of the Jewish law sect says it's nonsense. It's not law. It's something you want your uh, of course you are uh, uh, one of the biggest creators of the Israeli legal system, but your, your creation is not Jewish law, it's something else, and uh, it's very interesting to, to see what you wrote. Uh, I, I, I totally... I expressly didn't go there um, 
in this article, because in this article I wanted to flesh out if we accept as a fact what Barak says without buying his argument about what it says about the place of Jewish law in Israeli reality. And we oh, ask that, ourselves... Says it's or this or that. And, and we ask ourselves... Jewish law is a part of Jewish law. And we, ask our, and we ask ourselves, is there a difference between the way Jewish law reacts to Israeli law in a place where there are a lot of Jews that go by that law and accept it as their law, orthodox and not orthodox alike, then uh, uh, Jewish law relates to American law which uh, Americans, uh, American Jews follow Orthodox and not Orthodox alike because it's legislated by Jews, because it's identified as Jews, as Jews law. Uh, I think this is an interesting category. And I think that, yes, there is a difference. And in that sense, that you object to his political agenda doesn't say that as a researcher of Jewish law and as somebody who tries to understand the process of the process of Jewish law, um, uh, his claim is not important. And I think that it uh, that you can mainly see it in the opposition to to Israeli law, which is much stronger than other places where there's separation of church and state or or whatever. And uh, therefore, this is a tana de Messiah. The law, the law, kushia but, and, and I and I the only thing is that but because that it has been Barak, it has been used as an insight by uh, Jewish uh, legal researchers to try to analyze these questions, which interests us. But you would also say the same about Jews living in America vis-a-vis -vis the law of the United States. Yeah, but States. I have to say that when that that when the, the Israeli passed an ordinance. Okay, or a decision which created a norm in England, it is less a Jewish law than when the Knesset legislated a law uh, with, uh, uh, okay? But it's equally Jews law in your sense. It is Jews well, law, but it's not system. identically Jews law because the percentage of Jewish input, both as perceived by the audience and as part of fact, is less. But I thought that just, you're now using this term in a new sense. Here you say any normative system that applies to Jews and Jews recognize as binding them whatever the source is Jews law. Is yes. Jews yes. Law. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And therefore, no, no. The question the, was, the, the, the British legislation is also and Jews the law. The German legislation and the yeah, Russian yeah. legislation what, applies uh, equally wait, to Jews. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, okay. Type A Jews law, Legis legislated by Jews is everywhere all laws legislated by Jews. Jew, laws that apply to Jews, then British, law, uh, British laws that apply to British Jews, is Jews, law, is Jews law only for British Jews or for Jews who vid, okay. visit Britain. Okay, so that's not the same because the experience of law in England and in Israel for Jews is not, the mix but Israeli Between law, law and religion. But Israeli law doesn't influence American Jews when they live in America. Uh, well, not the church state. Yeah. Most of the Yes, I'm shy. Okay. Nedar, can. The Makom should have to take a Dina de Machuta Dina, in the terms of uh, Professor Ben Menachem, is one of the tools to recognize what already entered my. Dina uh, Machuta Dina is in 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 this re uh, in my proposal how to look at things is instead of saying okay this is external they push to bring it inside let's bring it inside okay is to say okay this guy sat at my table and he already sits here let's have him eat. Okay, so the, the process of Dina de Melchut Dina a lot of times doesn't happen at the door. Okay, it happens at the table and now I have to tell my kids who this guy is. And I say, okay, he's a good guest, he's okay. Okay, he's part of the family for now. 
It's not a system. Uh, sometimes it is. That's what uh, Shemuel Shiloh says, right? Sometimes we, we, we make him turn around at the door and say, that's not a, a, a chok. But Dina Machuta Dina, in a lot of cases, when it's already Jews' law, it is already a fact of life. What? Do you really think that, Dina Mach- that accepting equality in marriage law in Russia t- 15 years after the revolution was something that had to be discussed? It was a fact. You could try to convince yourself, you could try to make yourself believe uh, fictions, but that, that already necessitates a lot of cultural resources, as we see uh, ultra-Orthodox community try to do now. If, if there is a, a, a certain way to do bills and you don't recognize them, then your community will be poor because nobody will uh, have commerce with them. So y- your ability to, the, the price of not recognizing this way to do commerce is so, so big that it's a, mainly a political question. Do I recognize this or not? After I recognize it, the question is how do I deal with it internally? But the, the, the question is at the door is a different question about how I deal with it when it's already inside. And I, if I understood correctly, the main question was when it's inside. It's external law and now it's part of my life. How, do I re- how does it influence? I think it's more like what's going inside a room than about regulating who gets in, in the room. I haven't thought about this. I haven't thought about this. This is very, very neat. If I understand you correctly, you're saying the following. I argued before that there are areas that are a lacuna in Jewish law. Why it is a lacuna in Jewish law? Because other legal systems regulate it. Right? And now you say, well, Chok Yisrael Tamishpat did Structurally, it's it's a mirror uh, image. I'm not sure. Structurally, you're t- but that's probably not, right. It's not that the reason. That yes, but it's. I, I don't think it's. It has the same function. I think it's more aesthetically than a real argument. But it's neat. It could be even a nice package. Yes. Okay. But I'm not sure. Talking about. Because I mean, I, this is a part of what I have been thinking about in my research about the contemporary situation with um, Kashrut in America. That um, issues of um, labor, environment, immigration, that the law doesn't have anything to say about it. The halacha. The halacha. That's the current um, view. But I mean, how, I guess I'm trying to tease out how much that is really the case and how much that is um, not a perception. I think that the more halacha will feel that labor issues are part of the daily life uh, that is regulated or is expected to be regulated by Jewish law, uh, people will deal with it more. The same with emigration. Um, and here I think there is an interesting interplay. On one side, 
if the general law regulates it, there is a feeling that I don't have to do the job or it's less pressured. On the other side, we see that the more it becomes part of life, slowly, bottom-up processes start, people start writing about it. And we can see that happening in Israel already. And probably then, uh, 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 because the reality is already there, that the first phase has been regulated by general law, uh, uh, part of the Jewish legal development is from the sources, original, whatever, but part is reactionary. And what, is, what I suggest really happens is the interaction between the traditional Jewish law and the Jews' law. And that is the focus of research that I'm proposing. I don't think that Jews' law as itself is the category to, that's, a, that's more sociology of law, of, of, of Jews' law. Uh, uh, which is maybe interesting, but not what interests me. What more interests me is the what you said, uh, uh, Hanina, how Jewish law relates to this, to these uh, new phenomena, which are not foreign, but they are internal in some sense. Okay, last question. No, no, uh, Hanina, go. Um, what really struck me when I was reading your paper is um, how different the dynamics are, uh, whether you're talking about the diaspora community or the diaspora in general in Israel. The major difference being that in one case, Jews are a minority and the other, Jews are the majority. And for so much of Jewish history, processes within Acha have been shaped and defined by the fact that Jews are a minority. And so I wonder if if you decide to keep this framework, or you can account better for the differences between being a majority and being a minority. And I think you really have to account for the fact that I think the, the creation of the modern state of Israel is a watershed event from um, an elastic perspective. And I wonder how much, if you really um, compare you know, diaspora versus Israel, how much um, the Alakha itself and how much Alakha's perception of other uh, other legal frameworks is shaped by this transition from being a minority to being a majority. If that makes sense. I think the answer is a big yes, but I would say it's compl I, I would offer it's more complicated than that because actually what's going on here is that the, the Orthodox community or the community that uh, develops um, uh, Jewish law inside the Jews law is a minority. It doesn't view itself as a minority intellectually or power-wise uh, because they represent all of Israel all over its generations, so we are the real Israel. But So we have a double minority in the diaspora, and you have a minority within a majority in uh, Israel. This is much, uh, it's much more complicated power relations, and they have to be fleshed out uh, in order to uh, talk about these kind of relations. I did part of that in the external uh, analysis and it should be done internally too. Okay. Me? Okay. Okay, I'm puzzled by your analysis on two accounts. If I understand you correctly, you, you invite us to reconsider the notion of the legal system. Traditionally, we speak about the legal system we always think about the system that has what is called the rule of recognition. Mm -hmm. Your analysis seems to throw this notion out of the window. And I don't get how you can think of the legal system without the rule of recognition. The rule of recognition might be very complicated, very difficult to grasp, but there must be a rule of recognition. Any normative system, any normative system, not only a legal system, any normative system, by definition, in my view, needs to have a role for the mm -hmm. And I don't see how you can come up with a role for the that will be, will be operated before the end, not after the end. Before the end, not after the mm -hmm. That is one question. The second question, the second thing why I'm puzzled by your analysis, is I think that it's much more plausible to describe human existence as being subjected to many different claims. That idea that we are subjected to different claims, morally, 
religiously positive law, religious law, describe much more accurately, I think, human existence. And that is why we are torn with different calls. You are trying to describe as if we are under one holistic system. Yeah, when I come here, I'm under Israeli law, under religious law, under moral law, under many different calls. And there are many different claims, and I'm torn between that. That is what human existence is all about. If you are trying to give a holistic picture, then everything is fine. We internalize this law. It's part of our system. And everything is fine. No, everything is not fine. We are under different claims. Where does it go? Wow, thank you for both of them. And I think we go back to a very old discussion. Who needs a rule of recognition in a legal system? Does a kid need a rule of recognition about to which system a rule belongs to in order to identify it as a rule? And probably in some sense, the kid needs it. It's his parents' uh, rule. He doesn't care where it comes from. The rule of recognition is, uh, I know this is forbidden by my parent, by my teacher, by whatever. But the socialization process in a complex world, as opposed to simple world, uh, doesn't necessitate to employ the rules of recognition as part of the socialization process. This is an issue of the way the law faculty now is structured. But if we think about how law is socialized and experienced, and therefore maybe also should be researched, not as the only way, I, I don't throw away the rule of the recognition, but I offer that not only kids, and there's, I think there's very few experiences of kids that are not relevant to the very serious world. Um, so I think that this experience, this simple thought experience influences judges and, and uh, rabbis too. And going now to the second part of the question, and I'll try to connect them both because I'm not sure I formulated this Clearly enough, a complex system, is it one system? What is complexity? This is, I think, the, the, the argument between us. Is complexity a lot of systems uh, uh, which interact with, with each other in a net, All right? What? Interact, interaction in, includes, in my book, okay. contradictions. So I see um, a complex network in some sense as one and in some sense as fragmented. Okay? But I want to account, yes, as an ideological radical feminist, the network over the components. So in that sense, I am a feminist radical thinker uh, preferring the uh, taking responsibility for the relations between the, the parts analytically analyzed than focusing on each part of the system as its own, as the main tool for uh, grasping reality. So I recognize that in traditional uh, jurisprudential analysis, this is the opposite. So yes, analytically, this project focuses on the network aspects of the complexity more than on the seeing them as separate realms in um, uh, external relations to each other. 
This reflects back on the rules of recognition, which says, maybe I would take then from Bourdieu, saying that in that sense, I would recognize that for some rules, people would have different rules of recognition, but they would all recognize that this is a rule. And f they would live in peace with each other. So people would say this is a rule in this, from this uh, 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 source, of uh, uh, source of authority, or even area of discourse or perception of the world. Another one would say, no, this comes from another world altogether, but as long as we see it as a rule, we can live with, we both recognize it as a rule and as a rule in the same extent, we could live with each other not badly. Uh, what? What you just described. I know. I, I, I cite I Bourdieu. I, I, no, yes. I thought, I thought you said you don't want to do that. What? I thought you don't want to do sociology. Again. No, but this. What this, you just said, that what you cite is sociology. But what I say that if that's how I analyze it, and I, I think that this, un, this influences. I take this, I internalize it into the person. I say this is unescapable, the, ex the cognitive experience of legal experts, and therefore it influences the halachic process in an unescapable, analytical way. So the, I don't leave it at the sociology. I say this is internalized into the way uh, cognitive perceptions or cognitive processes work in analytical mind, and we could see, it's not here, at the end, we will be able to see actual signs in halachic processes that signify this process. That's my argument, so, I think. Okay.